Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare Hare Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare 
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्णा हरे Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Hare Krishna, 
Krishna and Pranam's dear devotees. So welcome to our special session today by His Grace Mahatma Prabhu. Uh, 
we are very very fortunate to have uh, got uh, maharaj association today and uh, many of us have grown in our spiritual life uh, hearing uh, maharaj lectures uh, seminars and recently we also attended on the japa it took on two weekends the japa uh, retreat so we are very very fortunate that and uh, <laughs> he's uh, joining us from us and the time right now must be 5:30 or so early in the morning uh, while uh, confirming the time i did not cross my mind so i'm very sorry to have kept it so early in the morning so many of us know prabhu ji very well uh, but still many devotees are new so i will share a brief uh, introduction about prabhu ji uh, prabhu ji joined uh, prabhu ji was born in california usa in 1950 and uh, in 1969 he joined he came in touch with the uh, devotees propad as it is and uh, uh, then uh, next year he met uh, shri propad hari krishna Hare Krishna, Prabhu, you are not audible. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Sorry, it got stuck. So you couldn't hear anything, I believe. So in um, he first met Prabhupad through Bhagavad Gita, as it is, and then later that year he met Sri Lal Prabhupad personally in Los Angeles, and in January nineteen seventy. Prabhu ji moved into the temple in Berkeley, California, and shortly after he received first and second initiation. Then he went. Prabhu ji went to do a variety of services, including uh, book distribution, sankirtan leader, temple president, college preaching, congregational development, and various educational projects. So it has culminated into various uh, workshops, social media, online courses, books, both for devotees as well as for general public. many of us would have read those wonderful poems which you know we we read so often which prabhu ji has written also he has his company uh, satwa uh, www.thesatwaway.com and uh, prabhu ji shows in many practical ways how we can um, uh, you know uh, cultivate krishna consciousness how we can pr- practice cult- uh, krishna consciousness and today Uh, he is known all over iskon as a very scholarly devotee as a very uh, senior vaishnav from whom many many uh, devotees all over uh, iskon world take benefit of his association there are many many uh, seminars on prabhu ji's website on uh, on various uh, from japa to guru tatva to problems in spiritual life and uh, so Uh, we have benefited tremendously from hearing and today we have his uh, this great opportunity to hear from him directly prabhu ji is based in alakua uh, florida uh, along with his uh, wife janva mata and daughter braj sundari and travels uh, four months in a year uh, so we loud we heartily welcome prabhu ji by loudly chanting hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram ram ram, ram hare hare His Grace Mahatma Prabhu ki jai. Welcome, Prabhu. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. One second. I was just chanting Gayatri. <laughs> And I also request devotees to please switch on your videos. Uh, uh, those who are some, uh, you know, some exceptional circumstances is fine. Others kindly switch on um, your videos so Prabhu ji can see, and you can also interact properly. Thank you so much. Shri Bharai Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Ti Namine Namaste Sarasvati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunivari Pashchati Dasatani. It's nice to see all of you. I was in uh, your city last, maybe I don't know, twelve years ago or eight. eight I think eight nine eight nine years back. Eight nine years ago, we eight were, nine years back, and at that uh, time we were living in India, and we happened to be there. So I think we had spoken about Japa at the Sunday feast, wasn't it? Yes, Prabhu. Yeah. 
Hare Krishna. So, um, we were going to speak on one topic, but we've changed that due to the current situation. Uh, we wanted to speak, or I was asked to speak on uh, how we could better deal with the current situation. And my first thought when I heard the topic, what was the topic? How to remain Krishna conscious in challenging circumstances. Uh, my initial first thought was that everything Prabhupada's teaching us directly or indirectly answers this question. So the natural first answer that came to me is be more Krishna conscious. The more Krishna conscious we are, the, the more we will remain stable or steady in trying circumstances. And of course, that's how Bhagavad Gita begins. Arjun's in a trying circumstance and Krishna's trying to steady him, right? And that, that you see in the second chapter, many chapters in Bhagavad Gita, but specifically the second chapter when Krishna is telling Arjuna to transcend duality because that's the nature of the world. It's, it's up and it's down. And if you go up and down with the world, then you'll, you won't be eligible to be Krishna conscious. He uses that, um, that word, eligibility, right? Now, if you steady, you're eligible. And he also uses the word practice, practice tolerance. Learn to practice. You have to, to, you have to learn. No, he said learn. You have to learn. It doesn't say practice. You have to learn to be tolerant, but how do you learn? You learn by practice. And so every difficulty we face is an opportunity to learn to be tolerant. How do you learn? You practice being tolerant. And practice means I may not feel very tolerant of a situation, but I practice it because that's how I will learn to transcend it. So... Then the next thought I had, I mean, that, that can be a whole topic of, of one class, just transcending duality. But I, I want to express a few thoughts first, and then we can see what we want to focus on. One very powerful thing that Prabhupada said, or a couple of powerful things that Prabhupada said, one was in the context of a prediction he made that there would be war. So could you imagine... You're on a morning walk with Prabhupada, and he says, "Very soon there there will be World War Three. That's that's pretty scary, more scary than coronavirus, because the ramifications of World War Three means that it could be you know, annihilation in massive numbers. So it was quite a quite a shock, and one of the leaders began thinking, "Well, if that's the case." There are, you know, the big cities will be targets, and therefore we should move deities, move devotees, and take precaution to move to new places which would be considered um, not in the line of fire, so to speak, not major metropolis areas that we would have to worry about. So he was expressing that to Prabhupada. You know, it was, it seemed to be a practical consideration, but Prabhupada took the mentality or the consciousness different. And he said something, which was hard to forget. And Prabhupada said, so you were thinking you're not going to die? He said, you're going to die either today or tomorrow. So it was just uh, obviously a shocking statement. And and if we if we translate that statement, then we, we have to understand the context that obviously this devotee was not just concerned about the devotees and the deities and the movement. He was also thinking, well, that means if we don't do something, I'll die also. So na natural instinct, we don't want to die. So that's, that's what Prabhupada chose to speak about at that point in time. And... I think he was speaking to all of us when he said that, obviously, don't you think? And another thing that Prabhupada said, which also it relates to this point, 
and I think it relates to Prabhupada's position in general. When Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and, and preparing to leave his body, I was at that time 27, and the older, older seniors were like 37, 38 perhaps, but most of us, I would think the majority of the movement was under 30, and so at that age, you're at least 40, 50 years from dying. Generally, of course, you could die before. But generally, you're 40, 50 years away, so you don't think about it. It's just out of your mind. It's, you know, it's like if you're going to go on a vacation to America in 10 years, it's like you don't really think about it. It's so far away. What to speak of 40 years. And so Prabhupada, knowing how we think, said, don't think this won't happen to you. Like, like of course it's going to happen to us. It's obvious. But by saying that, he's saying, but you're thinking it won't. Right? You know, because you're young. So when you're young, you, you, you think. You don't even think about it when you're young. Also, you've probably heard this before, but there was not one devotee in our movement that ever thought, Prabhupada was going to leave. It's just that was inconceivable to us that he would leave, especially in 1977 when we were so young. But there was, there was in our mind, Krishna consciousness movement meant Srila Prabhupada. And so we couldn't imagine a movement without him. And so obviously he wasn't going to live like 50. He, Prabhupada died and he was like 82. So now he would be, what, 132 or something something like that or how many years it's been 77 yeah almost yeah so it'd be, he'd be like a hot what 129 or something now obviously he's not going to live that long but it's um like Prabhupada was the way i took what he was saying was I, the way i would translate it is um you know what i'm telling you in my books is actually true and you don't believe it you know like on one morning walk um, or on different morning walks, Prabhupada would say something and say, do you believe it? Like, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God, do you believe it? You know, or, or Krishna will protect you. Do, you, do you believe it? So, you know, when I, when I heard this question, um, or I heard the title of this class, that thought came to my mind. Well, I've told you all these things, do you believe it? Because, because often when it happens, we we often don't respond, not all of us, but sometimes, uh, you may have seen in your life, sometimes we don't respond as we've been prepared to respond. Because maybe we think um, it's not going to happen, or maybe we it's too, um, maybe it's too difficult a thought to even think about it. So we think, well, I don't have to worry about this because, you know, my life has been pretty normal, and these Great traumas have never happened to me. And it's interesting, just I can give you my perspective as a, a devotee who has to help or other people come to for help during times of difficulty. And, you know, a common question like the question for this class is how, how do I deal with this? Which, which it's a genuine question com coming from sincere devotees who are often facing very difficult circumstances as you are facing now in India, especially India. Of course, the whole world is facing, but especially India, and now with the passing of Pankajangri, it just adds to the pain. And my first response when I hear those quest questions is, I understand the question, I understand the pain the devotee's going through, but it's not like I have something new to say that hasn't been said already, like the answer is already there. It's kind of like, you are been trained as a military man, and then you go out to battle and you ask, what do we do now? And you say, we've been trained for three months or six months or years to do this. Why are you asking? So, you know, every, you could say every class, every lesson is directly or indirectly a training, isn't it? And how to deal with the dualities and difficulties of this world. And what... I think what happens is when devotees are going through great difficulty, it's like it's like the reality of what we've read 
finally happens because it's not an everyday affair and we're we're unprepared for it. But as I said, Prabhupada's saying, but don't think this won't happen to you, but we're not prepared for it. We just somehow or other don't think it's going to happen. And so even asking the question, how should we deal with it? It's, it kind of reveals the fact that I was unprepared for this because I read about it, but reading about it is much different than dealing with it, isn't it? You know, we're just sitting, it's comfortably, we read, we, we have a class, and then we take prasadam and have kirtan and jump up and down. And, and it's almost like, wait a minute, did we actually understand this? So it's like, I think it's, it's nice, it's a nice mantra to hear Prabhupada's voice saying to us, do you understand? Like you read something and ask yourself this question and think, Prabhupada's asking me this question, do you understand? Not does this make sense to you, but do you understand? Or, or another question, do you believe this? Or, or the other question, don't think this won't happen to you. There, there will be difficulties. So my personal answer to that question for myself is whenever there's difficulty, my, my first immediate response is Prabhupada's given us all the solutions. So I just have to go deeper into what I've already been given. I have to reflect more and more. And specifically I have to apply. And perhaps I'm not applying well what Prabhupada has given. And um, yesterday I was listening to Jananivas speak about Pankajangri. And, and I don't know if you've heard that, and if you have, I don't know if you, you felt the same way I did, but one, one of the things I felt, there are many emotions, of course, but one of the things I felt is that he's so Krishna conscious that he has accepted that Krishna has taken his brother. Krishna wants his brother back. And you could see that in his talk. Like, so, like, this is a reality. And, you know, at a certain point, it became obvious that this reality was was happening and there was nothing we could pray but it seemed that that was not krishna's desire and you could see so much uh, in his demeanor and his consciousness that this was a reality which he was accepting and um that's what stood out to me more than anything he said was how he how he was dealing with it as okay this is krishna's will and krishna's desire and if this is what krishna wants then we must accept it. So I think that's important for all of us to appreciate, at least about Jananivas. And I mean, I'm not there, so I can't say how he's dealt with it in every situation, but that was the impression I got. There was um, a story long ago in Mayapur. A, a devotee, a member, um, very dear to Iskon, had come to Mayapur it was an elderly lady. Well, I don't know how old, but I guess when I heard the story, I was 25, so I think she was 40 or 50, so that was elderly for me at that time. And there was news that her son had died. But when she showed up in Mayapur, she was very blissful and very in a, in a very good mood. And so the devotees thought, oh, this, this is a rumor it's not true. It can't be true because she's just so joyful and blissful. And so I think it was Bhavananda who told the story. He may have approached her. He was in charge of Mayapur at that time. He may have approached her and said, oh, it seems the rumor is not true. And that your son has died. He said, no. No, he died. He, Krishna's, you know, she said something Krishna conscious. Like, well, Krishna took him or it was his time or he went back to God into something like undisturbed, and like incredible, just blissfully in Krishna consciousness. And, um, so recently, some devotees that wrote me, they had a, a miscarriage, and the baby came, and they got to see the baby. You know, there was, I don't know how many months it was, but the baby was fully developed, not fully developed, but the baby was developed, and they, all the limbs were there and so forth, and they were describing to me and what it was, and trying to understand how this soul had come, and they had done their service, 
and uh, this soul had to spend a few more months in the material world for whatever reason and and we discussed it and we could see that as we discussed it the more we discuss it from a krishna conscious point of view the more it makes sense and the more we can deal with it and the more we see it from a material point of view then we're going to lament that arjuna is lamenting that's he's He's showing the nature of the material perspective, and Krishna is changing his vision. And when Krishna changes his vision, he's not lamenting anymore. But until that vision changes, he's lamenting because the material world is lamentable. It just is. That's the nature of it. And so, I don't know if you've ever heard this very, very heavy, heavy statement Prabhupada made. I don't know the context, but Prabhupada was told that such and such a devotee is not happy. And Prabhupada said something really heavy. He said, if, he's, if a devotee is not happy, he's a rascal. So what did Prabhupada mean by that? No, no, no Prabhupada explained what he meant. He said, he's a, ra he's a rascal. He must not be following Krishna consciousness. Like, wow. You know, just like Prabhupada would say things that for us felt like, tsunamis just <sighs> you know sometimes we have difficulties sometimes we face trouble we may not be happy or as happy as we should be and prophet saying you're a rascal in other words no matter what happens you should be happy so so you could flip that around and say well if you're lamenting you're also a rascal now that that of course is it, it sounds very insensitive and i don't mean it to be that way because I know some of you have friends or relatives or some of you may be um, ill as well. And I know the situation in India is, it's very, very heavy. And I don't want to make Prabhupada out to be insensitive. I don't want to sound insensitive. But at the same time, Krishna consciousness, it's the only place we're going to get shelter when there are situations we can't change because the only thing we can change is how we deal with it. Um, and we, I saw this again and again when Prabhupada was presented with situations, difficult situations devotees were going through. And he, he, there were situations which he couldn't do anything about, like someone had died or someone was ill or someone's husband left their wife or situations like that. And he couldn't, he couldn't bring them back from the dead. He couldn't cure them. He couldn't get that husband to go back, or maybe that husband shouldn't go back because he was abusive or whatever. And and Prabhupada's answers were always to direct them, to direct their consciousness in a way that they could be stable and still be happy in their spiritual life. And happy in their spiritual life means that they'd have the strength to deal with these material difficulties. That's where he always went because ultimately that's that's the only thing, it's the only way he could help them in that situation because he couldn't change it. And so sometimes, you know, it could sound insensitive, but I think when Prabhupada's making those very heavy points, it's he's making deep philosophical points and he's trying to shake us up and that's his duty. And whenever he did that, it would shake us up and it would shake us up in a good way and we would realize, well, we needed that because we we don't always see things in the most Krishna conscious way. And so he would shake us up and in shaking us up, it was like he was saying, you know, I've already told you how to deal with this. Why are you asking? Something like that. Like, like I've already given you everything you need to deal with it. So whenever I've been in difficulties, I've always felt grateful that, that even though it's difficult, at least I have the knowledge the potential is there. I have the, you know, I'm, I'm so much better situated than the average person. It's not that it's not painful and it's not that it's not difficult and it's not that we don't feel separation from loved ones and devotees. But at the same time, we have the tools to deal with it in, in, in perspective. I'll give you an example of my own life. My father became an atheist when my, my mother died of cancer and she suffered a lot. And she was only 66 when she died. And that he couldn't understand if there was a God why he allowed that because she suffered so much. 
And so he turned and became an atheist. And he lived to be 92. And the last year of his life, he asked me to come to where he was and take care of him. So I, I came. We spent a year there. He only lived like another year. And he went, as people do, they go into a state of, I forget what they call it. They're not externally conscious. So they don't seem to be conscious. I forget the name of that, before they die. And so in that state, I could I could do whatever I wanted with him. So I put neck beads on him. I was giving him Radhakund water. He had already taken prasadam. I would chant my rounds in the morning, just sitting next to his bed. Um, I would read Bhagavad Gita out loud. And apparently when they're in that state, they hear, but they can't express themselves. And then... Um, my sister was there staying, you know, she'd come and go. She lived near him. We had a, a, a nurse who would come and go. But at this time, I think it was early in the morning, I, I had either showed up or stayed overnight, I forget. And my sister had, or it was late at night or early in the morning, my sister had fallen asleep. So it was just my father and I were there. And then this was the first death I witnessed. And then, you know, he's... He's lying in this state where he's not moving much anyway for days. And then all of a sudden I can see there's there's no breathing. It was you know, it wasn't much different, but I could see that he had left his body. And that morning I had chanted Japa, Red Gita, he'd be getting Radha Kun water every day, wearing Tulsi beads and so forth. So and he was um he had was losing his sight, he could no longer walk, he was losing his hearing. And he really didn't want to live because his body had fallen apart. So when my sister woke up, or I woke her up and told her, she was devastated. And um, and I was thinking, this was such an auspicious leaving. I had a totally different experience. I was really happy. I said, this is... Because I wasn't there for my mother, and I lamented it. I later lamented. I should have been there. And so here was such a contrast between how a devotee feels and thinks and how a non-devotee, how my sister dealt with it. And, and for years, she just had such a problem dealing with it. She couldn't, she packed up all his stuff and she couldn't get rid of it for years. It's like, I can't even look at it. And for me, it was like, no, this was an auspicious leaving. This was, and he didn't want to stay, he was just suffering. So it was, it was just a, a reaffirmation of how fortunate we are to have this knowledge because it helps us cope, potentially cope with every situation. So if we take that statement, the Prabhupada said, if he's not happy, he's a rascal. Then we could say, well, if we're lamenting, we're also rascals because lamenting means you're really not happy, extremely not happy, right? Now, does it, of course, devotees lament, as we're saying, in separation. And so it's not that we don't have emotion, but uh, Prabhupada is saying material lamentation because material lamentation means what? You were thinking you weren't going to die, no one's going to die, we'll live forever happily in the material world. All the things that we know, that we learn, every day practically, right? Yeah, but, and now you're lamenting about, and you should have been prepared for this. So, of, of course, it's easy for us to say, yes, we shouldn't lament, and yes, we should always be happy, and yes, we have all the tools and knowledge, it's easy to say it, but in the situation, it's not always so easy. So I'm, I'm speaking more in terms of at least, for the average devotee, at least I would say you have the potential to deal with every situation. You have the knowledge and the practice and potential. And um, the last thing I was thinking when I said this title is that something unusual happens. I don't know if this has ever happened to you or you've seen it happen to a devotee, but I find it so unusual that sometimes devotees have written me when they've gone through great difficulty, they've stopped chanting, like they've lost faith in Krishna. Krishna, how could you allow this to happen? And they actually stop chanting, which I find so strange because my response is always the opposite. That's when... I always feel during the greatest difficulty, that's when you have to do the, take the process more seriously. And those difficulties are often the strongest impetus to taking the process more seriously. So 
that that's also the other answer. What do I do? How do I deal with it? Whatever you're doing in Krishna consciousness, now you do it more. Or, or whatever you're doing in Krishna consciousness, now you do it with greater quality, greater depth. Uh, now it's time to reflect more deeply. Now it's time to go more deeply into the Holy Name. And in our Japa workshops, I often ask this question. When you were facing difficulty, did your rounds get better? And most devotees say, yeah, they got better. Some devotees say, those were the best rounds I ever chanted because I had the greatest difficulty. So that should be our our automated response to difficulty. Like as soon as there's difficulty, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, that should be, okay, I have to take shelter. That should be, what's the word I'm looking for? Default. That should, our default response to difficulty should be to take shelter in the processes that Prabhupada has given us. And it's when we don't take shelter in those processes it's when we don't take shelter in the philosophy or try to apply the philosophy or try to understand the philosophy in relation to that situation. To that degree that we don't do that, to that degree, then we're confronted with the same kind of suffering that everyone else has. And that's, it's always, it's always awkward if, if I see, and maybe you've seen this also, even experienced this yourself, there's a kind of awkwardness when a devotee responds the same way a non-devotee responds to the same situation. Because when it happens, the question is, uh, the question I ask myself is, wait a minute, but why are we responding like they are? Because we are not like them. And we don't, we don't, we have what they don't have. And so it, it doesn't make sense. We should be responding the way they are responding. We're in such a better position. So that's something to consider. Uh, and then we ask ourselves, okay, if I'm responding like them, like an average person, then we ask ourselves the question, what's missing? What am I not understanding? Why am I responding this way with, with all the knowledge I have? Of course, if a loved one dies, a dear devotee goes, naturally, it's going to be difficult. But my point is we have, we have, the, we have everything we need to better deal with that difficulty. It's going to be difficult, there's no question. If your father or mother dies of COVID or a relative or a dear devotee or friend, of course it's going to be difficult. But your transcendental immune system should be much stronger than everyone else's. You should be able to deal with it better. You should be able to recuperate faster. You can, I mean, Krishna consciousness, it's, it's interesting. Because it's transcendental, you can be completely miserable materially and then go hear a class and, and think, that class was amazing. It was so blissful. Although your life at that point is completely miserable. But you just transcended it by hearing a Bhagavatam class or you chanted really good rounds. And it's like you, you completely left the material world and you were just relishing Krishna consciousness. And then, have you ever experienced that? It's kind of like you're, going, you're living in two different worlds and then you realize, oh, when I come back to the... the material world, if I'm in material consciousness, again, it's miserable. I'm ex but I wasn't experiencing the misery. So sometimes we get this tangible, tangible reality check that we actually are transcending even in the misery. And that's, that's the actual solution. And, and to me, that's like such a strong impetus for good japa. I, I just made a, I made a video and I was saying that if you want to chant good japa, it's actually the be one of the best things you can do to immediately prove your japa is face a difficult situation because it's kind of instantaneous improvement by force. You know, there's no faster way I know to... You can go to a japa retreat, you know, take you, you know, five days to improve your japa. But if you go through some difficulty, sometimes it only takes like three seconds. And there you are taking full shelter. And uh, that's good. If, if that's your response, that's good because that's how we should respond. And so um, I like to think that, like Prabhupada said, I've given you everything in my books. I like to think this thought, wait a minute, Prabhupada is giving me everything. I, said, I don't have a right. I don't have a right to be upset. I don't have a right to be intolerant. I don't have a right to lament. I don't have, I have a right not to be happy, even in spite of the greatest difficulty, because Prabhupada has given us everything. 
You know the end of the Gita, end of the seventh chapter of the Gita, where Krishna says he remains, what does he say, uh, undisturbed even at the time of death. You remember, you remember the first time you read that? That was kind of a wow verse, undisturbed even at the time of death. Like who's undisturbed at the time of death? Only if, uh, someone who's very, very elevated. And Krishna is saying, if you know me as the Supreme Person, the, the governing principle of the Adi Jagam Chayevidu, Payana Kale Chapi Imam Tevidu I think the verse is, is you'll, you'll know me even at the time of death. In other words, there'll be stability. I'll be there. You'll take shelter. In you know, we heard yesterday, Pankajangri was, he was always in a good mood, always joking, even up to the time of death. Uh, one of my godbrothers left his body, I think, about two years ago, and his wife told me he was telling jokes right up, you know, just being really funny, you know, which is unusual, isn't it? And that's a sign that, okay, this is, this is now in Krishna's hands, and this is his desire, and Prabhupada has given me all the tools I need to prepare for this, so let's do it. You know, we're we're ready for anything, kind of. So, in times like this, I think, I think the best strategy for all of us, or one of the best strategies, is to appreciate that we're devotees, appreciate that we have at least the potential to deal with this in the most beneficial way we possibly could, and and question ourselves: Am I actually living? The philosophy am i actually understanding it how am i reacting to this situation that will that is kind of a barometer for me to evaluate how i'm understanding how i'm applying krishna consciousness reflection it's always i don't know if you've experienced this before but if we don't respond in a krishna conscious way it's, it's always a wake-up call you know i thought i was more krishna conscious than this but look at how i'm responding to this situation you ever been in a situation like that where you it might be a simple thing just like getting angry or not being able to give up something or becoming intolerant or becoming upset or lamenting about something and you, and you look at it and you think why am i acting this way this is this is really shocking to me i thought i should i should be above this or i thought i was over this it's just a it's, it's just a point in time where you reflect and say, oh, uh, Krishna is showing me I need, I need to be more Krishna conscious. I'm sure we all experience that, isn't it? You ever had a, like an attachment for something? You're thinking, why, I, why I'm attached to this? This is not right. And it's, it's, yeah, I was looking for the word. It's a wake-up call. Like, oh, I thought I was more Krishna conscious. It's a wake-up call. So, so every challenge, every difficulty is a wake-up call to at least evaluate how you're doing. And if, if you're going through difficulty and you're going through well, then you can, going through it well, you can pat yourself on the back. Say, wow, thank you, Prabhupada, you've helped me um, by allowing me to, to understand what you've taught and take shelter of your process. I'm, I'm doing much better in this situation than I would have without you. So that's good. And if, if you're not taking it that way, then it's, okay, let's do a survey now. Something's wrong here. So I feel that's how Prabhupada would respond to any difficulty, any situation. The, the last thing I want to say, and we could have some discussion, is there's two, two things um, I, I would want to say about this. As you probably know, in, in order for a conditioned soul to make progress steadily and somewhat rapidly in Krishna consciousness, Difficulty is required because when things are too easy, we tend to become slack in our spiritual lives. And the classic question I ask devotees, I said, I, I ask, if everything in your life were perfect, would you become, would you have become a devotee? And it's very rare that anyone raises their hand. And so then the obvious question is, is it because everything wasn't perfect in your life? That you became a devotee, the obvious answer is yes. That that that's why. Um, and so we hear Prabhupada saying that the demigods have a difficult time. Not difficult to understand. You know, we have difficult time. Uh, if you were the richest man or woman in the world, 
probably it would be a little more difficult to be Krishna conscious than if you weren't, right? Because the potential to enjoy the world is just increased tremendously, and the ego uh, generally increases with your success. So it would be hard, harder, obviously. So if, if we acknowledge this reality that we need suffering it's like it's like a requirement we need periodic a periodic problem in our life it helps us that if it's too good this is of course as you advance in krishna consciousness this becomes less of an issue because your motivations are higher you have ruchi so you don't need to get to get the three tridents in your back to push you forward you're you're going forward by your own taste but until we're on that level we need those tridents, the threefold miseries. They help us because they remind us of why we became devotees, because we often forget. You know, because the suffering goes away when you become a devotee, then you forget that well, why you became. And so we see that that on different levels of our advancement, we need those things more often for some than others. And so when suffering comes to our door, at least one of the thoughts that I have, I think, oh, okay, Krishna is reminding me, because I was forgetting. I thought, I thought every, I thought, oh, I, I forgot there there were miseries in this world. I've I'm, I've managed to kind of escape them, you know. Actually, I've just been staying home, and you know, I don't see anybody. I don't know. Of course, in India, it's it's obvious obvious that there's, you can't escape it in India. But let's say for us in America, it's not in our face. I live on. I live on 10 acres of land in a small town of, not even a town, you'd call it a village, of 7,000 people. I don't have much interaction, <clears throat> and there's not a lot of COVID here, so it's easy, and the weather's nice, and the birds are chirping. Can you hear them, the background? So um, um, everything just seems to be fine, and you know. So it's easy to think that way, and then one of your god brothers leaves his body and like, okay, uh, reminder, hello, wake up. Uh, who's next? You may be next. Like, who's who's next on the list? We don't know. So, so through misery, Krishna reminds us of reality, and so it's necessary. I think that's an important thought. Uh, it, for all of us, it, whether that misery is coming to us or it's coming to another and we're hearing about it, it's sobering and necessary, at least at a certain stage of bhakti. And when a devotee suffers, it's a reminder to all of us that the world is suffering. And when a devotee tolerates the suffering, like Pankajangri, and leaves his body in Krishna consciousness, of course it's a great lesson and inspiration. And the last thing is that when suffering comes, the other thought a devotee has is he feels we're, we're devotees and we have the tools to deal with it and we find it difficult so we understand that for non-devotees it's the, the condition of the world today non-devotees extremely difficult um, i was told that mental illnesses stress etc has gone up like four thousand percent in the last year because of covid and people staying home and it's just having such a difficult time dealing dealing with it emotionally. And now, because of this spike in India, then it's just, you know, it's just magnified. It's not just just the direct emotional lockdown and restriction. It's the I guess I guess everybody knows somebody that's died or it's going to become that way. Or you you're you're well, not more than one or two people away from a friend of a friend or a relative of a relative. And um, for me, when things like this happen, it becomes an ins inspiration, an impetus to give Krishna consciousness. To, to really, you know, Prabhupada said, people are suffering. Sometimes it's, we don't always realize how they're suffering. And what Prabhupada meant when they're suffering is they're suffering without Krishna. And that guy in the big house, the Kaurapati in the big house, he's also suffering because he doesn't have Krishna. But we see the beggar on the street and think, oh, they're suffering, but the Korapati, he's not suffering. No, but that's not what Prabhupada meant. He meant that everyone's suffering, but sometimes it's hard to see that. And 
then at a time like this, it's easier to see everybody is suffering or potentially who's next, who's going to get COVID next, who is going to suffer through it. And so I always take these situations as a strong impetus to preach Krishna consciousness, to share it. People need it more than ever. And every misery for me is just a reminder that we, we have a huge responsibility in sharing Krishna consciousness. And anything that I can do that I'm not doing is kind of a travesty if I don't do it, if I hold it back. Anything I can do to help someone be Krishna conscious, anything more that I can do, go out of my way and make a sacrifice, I should do it. This is what Prabhupada wants. The world needs it, even if it's just a little thing, giving someone prasadam or a book <clears throat> or asking them to chant the mantra. To This will help you now chant this mantra. So those are some of my thoughts on that topic. So I think we could end now because you probably have some questions or if you'd like to ask questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Prabhuji. Uh, we heard how the uh, main thing you told us was uh, Srila Prabhupada gave us everything and also shared how difficulties uh, make us chant more with feelings and uh, we take uh, more shelter. You know, and it is right when most of us we chant more sincerely when we are in difficulties, and uh, also that they become like a wake up call for us because we understand we are not there what others believe us we are or I believe myself I am, so it became the test like a you know unit test or a half exam in the class, and uh, also how these miseries they help people join Krishna consciousness. Most of us join Krishna consciousness because we are suffering. And uh, so uh, these periodic sufferings are good for us. And also it gives us a big impetus, like we said, that uh, to preach that it is not the poor are suffering, the rich is enjoying, but every, everybody is suffering. So this is a very unique perspective uh, Prabhuji gave us. So now we will open uh, uh, for the question answers. So you can chat. Uh, here some of you have sent the chat uh, on the private or in the public, I will read your uh, questions. And also you can raise the hand on the Zoom also, so we can do. So first question we have from uh, uh, Neha Mataji. She's saying, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dhanavad Pranam. Thank you for the session. I have one question. As you said, when in distress, chant more. For me, I have experience. Even if I am chanting in during the time of difficulties, I am unable to concentrate at all. So in that case, chanting is mechanical and nothing more. And also it becomes very difficult not to think about uh, the problems uh, yes. you know, I'm facing during the chanting because mind is continuously there only. Rather earlier, still quality was improving, but now I'm unable to concentrate. So please help. When you're thinking of the problems, I'm assuming you mean you're you're thinking of the problem and thinking how to solve the problem or you know or or maybe thinking i don't know what to do about the problem one or the other probably i would assume is that correct who asked the question it was neha mataji can you confirm or clarify what you mean are you just thinking i can't stop thinking what to do about the problem or or just the pain of the problem um, something like, I would assume it's something like that. Is that correct? You could just say yes or no or unmute yourself and then I could, I could address it. That's, uh, that's my assumption. One second. So, yes, Ma. Yes, probably. She's saying yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. let's translate that into, let's translate that into, this problem is overwhelming and I need help dealing with it. Because if you're focused on the problem, I'm assuming it's overwhelming and you need help and maybe you, you either need help, you know how to resolve it, you just need help or you have no idea how to resolve it or it doesn't even, doesn't even seem resolvable. That, that is actually the very thing that can inspire you 
if you're in the right consciousness, to take shelter of the holy name. Because the holy name means, the Maha Mantra means, Krishna, I need help. So, and who's better to help you than him? Who can provide the greatest help? And then you might say, but there's nothing that can be done in this situation. Sometimes it's just, it's overwhelming. There's nothing that can be done. It's like this person is dying and we know they're not getting better. And they're, you know, everyone who gets to this point never makes it. And so, you know, you can't stop thinking about it. And so we're not going to pray to Krishna to help that person anymore because we know it's, it's beyond help. What are we going to pray for? We're going to pray, Krishna, please help me deal with this. So whatever the difficulty is and however you process it, you need help dealing with it. And that's what the Maha Mantra means. So, so it's actually that difficulty should be, can be, if you, if you put it in the proper context, the, the perfect impetus to take shelter because where can you go now? You have, you know, this person is, is in difficulty, I can't do anything, or maybe it's a relative in another part of the world. And, you know, you can't do anything other than pray. That's as much as you can do. And your consciousness is falling apart. And the only shelter, the only help you can get to keep yourself together is Krishna's help or Prabhupada's help. And so prayer is all we have left. So it, it's, it's at that point that if you process it this way, at that point you could be completely focused on Krishna because your need is strongest. And that was my point, how sometimes we go the opposite way. We focus on the problem instead of focusing on Krishna who can solve the problem either on the physical level or on the level of consciousness. So, like, like Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, the holy name is our only shelter. He was describing the holy name in different ways, and one of the ways he described it was our only shelter. And so, really, where is your shelter in that time of difficulty? And like when you say, I can't stop thinking about it, but you're, you can't stop thinking about it because you're not finding shelter. But when you find shelter in the holy name, that's the only shelter, and that's that's really the only way to deal with it. And um, for a devotee, the holy name's everything, and that's our go-to. You know, this is where we when when there's difficulty, where do you go? What do you do? That's the first place we go to. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. Krishna, help me deal with this. Right, so that's how you should process it. That's what I would suggest. And um, the greater the difficulty, the more we need shelter in the holy name. Right? That should be. That should be. Um, and the more your mind goes to that problem, the more it should then think, okay, this is this problem is is too great for me to to process. I need to just take shelter in the holy name. Uh, Krishna, help me process this. And, you know, sometimes, as we're saying, the material situation cannot change. So the process is not that Krishna is going to help change the material situation. He's going to help change me so that I can deal with the material situation. So sometimes that's the only prayer. Krishna, help me deal with this. This is overwhelming. Give me shelter at your feet. Um, and he will. And that will build your faith when you get that shelter there. And that will give you so much realization. And then if you can do that, then in the future, whenever there's difficulty, you, you'll naturally be able to do that. Or maybe you'll naturally do that even when there's not difficulty. So, I mean, just think about it. Neha, just think about it. Prabhupada, I like to think that Prabhupada has given us everything we need to combat everything that's coming at us. We have every weapon we need and all the way up to the atomic bomb. So no one can defeat us. Maya cannot defeat us. No lamentation, no difficulty can defeat us. But we have to know how to use the atomic bomb <laughs> or all the other weapons we have. So I think that's part of the problem. He's given us the weapons, and we either don't know how to use them or we don't realize he actually gave them to us. You know, The enemy's coming. What do we do? Hey, you have an atom bomb. You have nothing to worry about. You could use that. I really have one? 
yeah, you didn't know that? It's called the Maha Mantra. No one told you that's an atom bomb. It, it can destroy any problem you have, destroy any enemy that attacks you. So that's how I, that's how I would suggest seeing it. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. So she says, yes, that's a big help. So next question we have from Rani Prabhu. He's saying, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dhanu Panam. Uh, Prabhuji, how do we know <clears throat> what is the will of Krishna when we or our near ones are going through extreme difficulty and suffering? And how to be aligned with the will of Krishna? Well, the will of Krishna is an interesting topic because ultimately it's not the will of Krishna that anybody suffers. But it's like we're saying suffering is a, it's a necessary ingredient on the path of becoming Krishna conscious. Unfortunately, it's necessary. If it wasn't, Krishna wouldn't, Krishna wouldn't have any of us suffer. And um, I can tell you how I, I think. When I see suffering, or when I'm undergoing suffering, I think this is normal. Because we're in the material world, we have a material body, it's normal. Like, like one time, I think it was Shruti Kirti who told Prabhupada, I never get sick, I never get disease. And Prabhupada said, that's that's strange. There's all, the body's always diseased, something like that, you know. Like so, if I told you I never suffer, you'd say, well, "How is that possible? You have a material body. You never, you're never tired. You're never disturbed. You never bang your toe." Uh, a year ago, I banged my toe like every week for like six weeks, like in the same exact spot. You know, you ever done that? You you bang a toe or a finger, and then you do it again and again, the same spot. Like Krishna, you know, like you're playing jokes on me or what, you know, so no, just a little reminder, you know, a little reminder where you are. So um, that's my thought process. Like, like, I don't mean to be insensitive, but at least the way I think for myself, even even if it's difficult and even if I'm feeling compassion, I still think we're in we're in a play. It's like going into the hospital and saying, "Why are all these people sick? What's wrong here? Who's in charge? I need to speak to the, you know." Well, that's that's they're sick because it's a the hospital is a place where sick people or you go to jail. Why are these people behind bars? This is not right. We need freedom. No, they're all criminals. Oh, okay, now I understand. So why are all these people in this world suffering? It's the material world. Oh, okay, now I understand. It's like we brought it on ourselves. Like so, now I'm suffering because my mother or father, or brother, or sister, or dear devotee is is suffering. But if I didn't have a material body, that that wouldn't happen, right? It's not possible. But I chose to come here. I chose to enjoy. And we all know that the propensity to enjoy is kind of like an unfathomable pit. It's like deep as the ocean. You know, no matter how much we hear about that we can enjoy, no matter how much we experience, we always have a little hope somewhere in the back of our mind that, well, if I just, you know, do it this way, play my cards this way, then, you know, I can do better. So that's how I take it. Like Krishna's just reminded me, he said, don't think, you know, everything was good, everybody was happy, business was going well, you know, just got married, just had a child, everything was great. And I completely forgot that I'm in the material world and it's a place of suffering and I could die at any moment. So that's how I personally take it. And I I, nece I wouldn't necessarily tell that to someone who's suffering or, you know, if your mother's dying, just say, oh, whatever, you know, it's not, just it's not the body, why bother? You know, just take, eat your gulab jamans and chant your rounds and don't worry about it. You're going to die also, so, you know, who cares? I wouldn't say that. That's how we have to deal with it personally. That's how we, we talk to ourselves. That, okay, Krishna, you're reminding me, you know, that this, this was going to happen. So like Prabhupada said, you're worried about you're going to die. You'll die, you know, he, this devotee who asked Prabhupada, what should we do? He was 20, he was 24 at the time when he asked. 
you know, so 24, you don't really want to die. You know, 74, maybe it's like your body's kind of like, okay, if I give up my body, it's kind of a relief because it just hurts everywhere. But 24, no. So Prabhupada's saying, what, you thought you weren't going to die? Like, so, you know, your mother's sick or leaving her body and maybe she's only 56, which is kind of young to die. And so we ask ourselves, so you thought your mother wasn't going to die? Or you thought she wouldn't die until she's 75? Um, so we tell ourselves, okay, now you, now you, you have the philosophy. Now it's, it, the philosophy has come into your life. So here's your chance to practice it. That, that's, we have to take every situation in a way that can help us come closer to Krishna. That's, I mean, Arjuna is, I mean, look at this. Arjuna is lamenting. It's the Bhagavad Gita. He's lamenting about the death of his relatives. And Krishna's saying, you fool. They're not the body. You know, and that's, that's like, wow, those hard words, isn't it? But we can tell ourselves that you're lamenting, you fool. Um, like when Chitra Ketu when, you know, had that son that was poisoned and then Narada Muni brought him back and said, your parents want you to come back. And the kid said, what parents? What life? What are you talking about? You know, Which parents? I've had so many. You know, So you know, my mother's dying. Which mother? Which life? You know, What about the mother in your last life? Do you worry about her? No. You don't know about her. So these are all ways that we, we think uh, to try to help us. And, um, you know, there's this, this hard reality uh, that we have such a difficult time accepting is that we can't change certain things. It's just, it's, you, know, you know, I think the best answer to your question or, or one of the most important answers is what what's actually happening is we're confronted with a situation we can't control and that's the most difficult thing whether it's someone's dying or there's traffic it's kind of the same response in a certain way isn't it i'm late and there's traffic and did you know it's eight in the morning there's not supposed to be traffic until 10 and you know there's some accident or something and i'm going to be late and um it's just it's it's when we can't control the conditioned soul wants to control, it's very difficult. Whether it's controlling a traffic signal, controlling your spouse, your children, or controlling the inevitable of old age and death. So, you know, when these things happen, we just have to sit back and go, okay, Krishna is showing me I'm not the controller and I'm going to have to learn how to accept this. And then, as I said, at that time, we have to go very deep into our philosophy and really, really ask ourselves, did I understand this? Because it seems like I didn't. Because in this situation, I'm not responding as well as I should. That's the way I personally process it. And um, it, it, I tell myself when there's difficulty, I tell myself, well, what did you expect? You're in the material world. You expected something else. You made the wrong estimate. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, someone told you something else when you decided to come here that it wasn't going to be this way. But now you see it firsthand. So, you know, this is to be expected. Um, are you surprised that people are dying? You shouldn't be. You know, so that's how I, I process it personally. Like I say, I wouldn't necessarily say this to everyone in every situation because it's not always what they need to hear. But I think we can say it to ourselves. I think we should say these things to ourselves. Is that okay? Yes. He said yes, Punji. So thank you so much. So next question we have uh, from Vasu Prabhu, who's saying, Hare Krishna Prabhu, I read uh, that one should cry loudly when Vaishnava depart from the world. But other side, we learn we should not behave like non-devotees. We need to be stable. So I'm in dilemma. How should one react? Yeah. Well, this is a nice question because as we know, every material quality or action has a spiritual counterpart. So we have the song, Samsparshada. What is that? Pipala, the, the, the lamentation of the departure of a Vaishnava that we sing, Yani Lo Premadana, Samsparshada, 
free love. I forget the name. Someone know the full name of that song? Dhyani lo premadana kuruna prachur. What is it? Some sparshada vilapa. Something, something. Or vip, vipralamba. Yeah, I forget. So, um, every every quality has a nature which is transcendental, not influenced by the three modes, and the quality also influenced by the three modes. So the the lamentation, the material lamentation, like Arjuna is going through, Krishna is saying, if you are learned, you won't lament for the loss of the body. So when the Vaishnava is lamenting, he's lamenting the loss of the association. And now I've lost this great association, this person who was so dear to me because he was helping me so much in my Krishna consciousness. And we were, let's say, partners in service. And so um, that lamentation, that separation, it actually helps us because we think of that person more and we become more inspired. And that samsparshinda bhagavan viraha janita vilapa, yeah. So now you know why I couldn't remember that title. <laughs> Um, so the lamentation, the material lamentation takes you away from Krishna. The spiritual lamentation brings you closer to Krishna. A lot of times, Prabhupada would say something to just kind of confound us. You know, he'd be leaving and Prabhupada, we're missing you. And he said, he said, no, it's, it's better when I'm gone. It's better for you when I'm gone because that will help you even more. That will help your Krishna consciousness. Separation is higher. And you know, from for the material mind, it doesn't make sense. So that material lamentation is taking you away from Krishna, but that spiritual lamentation, I've lost the association of this great devotee. And so, what do I do? I think about that great devotee. Who is everybody thinking about lately? Pankajangri. Are we all thinking about him more than we've ever thought about him? Yes. Are we all more inspired by him than we've ever been inspired by him? Yes. Are we all becoming more purified by him? through that lamentation and meditation more than we ever have? Probably the answer to all of that is yes. And so that transcendental lamentation is is bringing us closer to Krishna. And it's not influenced by the modes of nature. right? So um, it's lamentation based on real love and affection. So Krishna is really preaching against material lamentation, loss of the body, bodily conception. And ultimately, it, you know, when you lose someone in the material world, what are you losing? You're losing the enjoyment of that person's company, right? So now I can't enjoy, you know, I want my mother, I want my mother to cook and she's leaving and I won't have the pleasure of being with her. But when we're talking about the lamentation of losing a Vaishnava, we're talking about losing the Krishna consciousness that we got from that person. But then we actually see we're even getting more Krishna consciousness when they leave. So we're, so it's totally different. Because one is like, I'm losing sense gratification. And we're not lamenting when we lose a Vaishnava that we're losing sense gratification. Certainly not. So you can answer that question with any, whether it's lamentation or greed or envy or lust. It all has a transcendental counterpart, which then inspires Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Prabhu, the, the title of the, that uh, song is Swar Prasad Bhagwat. And the last para was Se Sab Sangira Sange, Che Kailo Bilas, Se Sange Na Payo, Kande Na Rottam Das. I bang my so, head on the rocks. <laughs> separation. Yes. Thank you so, well, so much. Well, you me. know, you, Prabhu, you, you hear stories. Krishna goes back to Vrindavan and he finds Radharani almost dead, like you know, lying on the ground, like dried up, almost dead. And then when you go deeper into it, you find out this is like the highest ecstasy of Radharani's experiencing. So externally, what does it look like? The greatest suffering. But internally, it's the greatest ecstasy. So that, that's always confusing, right? How could it seem so painful? But um, the, the answer to that is in separation, 
you are totally absorbed in that person that you're separated from. And so if you're thinking of Krishna or Krishna's devotee, is it possible to not be ecstatic? So that's why it said it's like a hot chutney, but it's too, too, too hot to eat, but too sweet not to eat. So it's just this combination. And, you know, we can only kind of try to imagine it. It's only through experience that we'll ever understand it. But if you think of Krishna, you'll be blissful. If you think of Prabhupada, you'll be blissful. If you think of your guru, you'll be blissful. And if their leaving causes you to think of them more, you'll actually be more blissful in their absence. As strange as that sounds. Okay, you have more questions? Yes, Prabhuji. So, this is another question. It says, uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, please give us your point of view. Why diseases like COVID or any are unleashed upon humanity? What I believe is this sort of situation distract us from spirituality. Prabhupada talks about this in lectures, epidemics. He actually talks about it in Bhagavatam. Um, it is a distraction, but you know it's just something we have to deal with, so we don't allow it to become a distraction. I mean, any we see the way Maya works is anything can be a distraction, whether it's good or bad. Um, I mean, look how distracted we are by our phones, and nobody's complaining about phones. You know, probably a bigger distraction than COVID, and probably more detrimental in the long run at least for our Krishna consciousness. It can be, anyway. So, um, my first reaction to what was going on in the world with COVID is like, is like, I thought this was should have happened 20 years ago, you know, because of the, the increase in sin, abortion, cow killing, et cetera, et cetera. I thought, wow, this has come way too late. Like, why isn't it happening already? Why aren't there disasters? And Prabhupada, when he was asked this question, he said, because the Krishna conscious movement is holding back the tide, oh, at least a little bit. There's been no world wars. Oh, there have been smaller wars. Um, I, had, I had different thoughts about it, but my overarching general thought was there's a karmic reaction falling upon the planet um, due to the sins of people. Of course, the average person doesn't understand that. But to me, it was just like, this is kind of like a slap on the fist for really what's going on. How could we be killing so many cows and killing so many babies in the womb and not have tremendous disaster? And Prabhupada said, the consequence of cow killing is war. And Prabhupada said, if you protect the cows, you would solve every problem. And Prabhupada, in another lecture, I don't know if you're aware of this, said that epidemics are caused by lying. So I had kind of a joke, but it was I was half serious. Because our President Trump was found to be lying like 70 lies a day or something. It was like normal, like incredible. Uh, not that he was doing it purposefully. He just doesn't see the world the way it is. He sees it very much through his you know, own arrogance and ego. And so he would say all these things about himself and about what's going on, which were, were being fact-checked as, you know, false, false, again and again. And Prabhupada said that epidemics were caused by lying, especially lawyers lying in the court. So I thought, we have a president. Of course, so many leaders lie. But I think he has the record. And some of you may like Trump, not Trump, but these are just facts. And I thought, for whatever good or bad he's doing, I don't think it's healthy to have a leader who lies so much, because it actually contaminates the ether. So I so COVID, Trump was saying, you know, this is caused by the Chinese. And I'd say, no, you caused it because you lied so much. So, you know, I can't say that's true for sure, but at least that was going through my mind. I said, you know, this, this may take some investigation, but it's just we have COVID at a time where we have a president who's, who's lying every day more than any president ever. You know, I think the first day, you know, first week in office, he probably told more lies than most presidents did in their entire term. It was just incredible. So, you know, what what can we expect in a world that's not Krishna conscious, where people are committing sin, people are, leaders are lying and cheating, what can you expect? So when it happened, my thought was, 
this is just to be expected. And it is a disturbance, it is a distraction. Um, but what happened? The devotees took advantage of it for spreading Krishna consciousness. And here in America, book distribution like increased. They were devotees were calling all the people that had bought books before and doing so many things. And you know, obviously the the number of classes and seminars was increasing. So and uh, you know, we used to say the terror world's a miserable place and people would say, No, it isn't. But now if you say it, they're like, Yeah, it is. So it it every situation has some silver lining in it. And I think the the challenge for us is not to allow ourselves to get too absorbed in what's going on externally to the point where it deviates us. You know, you can be thinking vaccines, no vaccines, the cause of COVID, was it Chinese, was it conspiracy, was it actually natural? You know, what are the what are the world powers doing? They're trying to, you know, Bill Gates is trying to depopulate the world, so you know, it was all designed and, you know. But Prophet also said uh, once that India, the problem with India is that they suffer more because they know more. So like uh, America eats a hamburger, but they don't know there's anything wrong. But if you eat a hamburger, you know something's wrong. So the, rea the reactions are greater when you have knowledge. So that's always something that I think, you know, we see a lot of suffering in India. I think, why India? It's the place of dharma but that's the reason there's more suffering because it is the place of dharma so there's more reaction for not following dharma you know like ignorance is kind of safe it's a safer position just live in a cave and don't know anything then you commit some sin like you know and it's not really a big reaction because you didn't know still a reaction but the more you know the more the reaction so that's that's what Prabhupada said about india because it's a land of dharma they suffer more when they break dharma. But um, again, it's that same point. Well, you know, it's a challenge. And you, are you going to allow yourself to be deviated by this problem? Are you going to be able to to work through it? You know, sometimes people say, what do you think about the vaccine? You know, it's a big controversy. And, you know, I know it's an important discussion, but sometimes I think, like, do we have to talk about this? Can't we just talk about Bhagavatam? Wouldn't that be better? Because you know, everyone's going to decide whether they want to get the vaccine or not, or the best way to protect themselves anyway, ultimately. What, and I'm not a doctor, so it's not my role to prescribe one or the other. And I could tell you all to get vaccine, and in five years we find out, you know, your hair falls out, your arms fall out, and, you know, it's, it's my fault, I told you to do it. Or I tell you not to do it, and you all die. So, you know... It's it's you know it's just it's the situation we're in. It's easy to distract distract us, and so be careful. If it's not COVID, it'll be something else, right? If it's not COVID, it's your phone. If it's not your phone, it's the latest Bollywood movie. It's not a Bollywood movie. It's the latest political situation. If it's not that, it's a stock market. If it's not that, it's the, <coughs> the new earrings on sale down the street. You know, it's something, right? <coughs> Endless distraction, for sure. Sorry, Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Do we have time, Prabhu, for one last question? Yeah, go ahead. If, if you want to stay, I'll stay. <laughs> okay, Prabhu. Thank I'll you. I'll stay as long as you want to stay. If, okay. if this Thank is you, of use for you, then I'm uh, happy. This is, Thank you, Prabhuji. This is from Rashmi Mataji. She's saying, Hare Krishna, Prabhu, Dhanvatana. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what should we pray when devotees call us to pray for them? When somebody is in a difficult situation or somebody is going to leave the body, then what should we pray? And sometimes we say, Krishna, whatever is your desire, then, then you know, let that happen. But if it's already decided, then what is the value of our prayers? Can you please help enlighten this? Uh, great question. Well, like... It's a he or a she who asked? I, f I didn't get the name. Uh, Rashmi Mataji, she. Yeah, yeah. Rashmi, yeah. When Prabhupada was leaving, or when Prabhupada was ill, and it looked like he may not make it, the devotees asked, can we pray, Prabhupada, can we pray for your health? He said, you can, but you have to 
When you pray, you have to add to your prayer, if you so desire, Krishna, if you so desire. Because like Prabhupada saying, I don't want to stay if Krishna doesn't want me to. So you can all pray that I stay, but it must be his desire, his will. So that's true. If it's if a person's at a point where they're not coming back, then we can say um, it's his will. They're, it looks like they're not going to make it. So then, so the question is, well, what else is there to pray for? For a devotee, well, you know the story of Takar Haridas. He, he was in, put in prison and all the prisoners said, well, you're a sadhu by your mystic power or your shakti, you can get us out of here. And he's like, why would I get you out of here? You know, you go out of here, you'll commit sin. You're doing better in jail. So what was his prayer for them? His prayer was, don't get out of jail. Stay in jail. So what was his prayer? Be Krishna conscious. So I just heard a beautiful story. Uh, Prabhupada's godbrother, Pori Maharaj, one, one devotee went and prayed and said, please give me your mercy. And he said, I don't feel that I'm qualified to give mercy, but I will pray to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Saraswati Thakur, that he will give you his mercy. So that's the prayer of the devotee that I pray to Prabhupada that he will bless you in some way, that you can take up Krishna consciousness in your next life, or you'll be have the association of devotees, or you'll be blessed by the sadhus. And that's how a devotee prays. Of course, it's not unnatural to pray for the well-being and health of a relative or another devotee, but it should always be Krishna if this is your will. And the beauty of that prayer is if the person doesn't make it, then we are we are in that mood of, well, it's not his will. And I was not trying to interfere with his will. But if it's your will, I would like that, if that's okay with you. You know, something like that. But the more important prayer is that Prabhupada, please, please bless this soul with your mercy so that they can continue their spiritual life. And of course, while they're leaving their body to give them Tulsi, to give them the holy name like that. Yeah, I also gave my father Tulsi. He died of Tulsi leaves in his mouth. I mean, what more can we do? And that's the greatest blessing and the greatest prayer, I think. But it's an important question because definitely this comes up. What are we praying for? Just, okay, so you're, you know, you pray for your cousin, he lives. And so now he lives longer, but, but he's not Krishna conscious. So wouldn't it be better that he dies in Krishna consciousness and lives without it? Not that we want him to die, but that's the more important prayer. And Prabhupada, please bless him. Um, because, you know, Krishna, Prabhupada listens to his devotee, and if I can do something to, to give someone blessings, then that's the greatest gift I can give them. Isn't it? They could get Prabhupada's blessing. Like, like in my life, I met Prabhupada when I was 19. Let's say 19 and a half, I met him. And if after meeting him, I died, uh, or I found out I had some terminal disease, I, I would think, at least on reflection, I would think, I think, well, my life's successful. I met a pure devotee. Now I'm on the path. So I may not go back to Godhead, but I'm on the path. Uh, I will have the chance in my next life. So Prabhupada, please bless them that they have the chance or they become devotees in their next life or whatever whatever pious credits I have, please you know, give them to them so they can continue their Krishna consciousness, that continue or begin. That's how a devotee thinks. And, you know, and that way you, you don't lament so much about the leaving of the body. That's less important. Of course, you know, if it's your wife and you have children, obviously, you know, out of compassion for the children and your own sanity, you would pray. Um, please, if you, you know, they have. I prayed, I had a disciple who had a very young daughter and she, she was critically ill. And I um, did a lot of meditation and prayer for, for on behalf of her daughter. I said, she's, this is not good for her daughter. And fortunately, she made it. So sometimes we may, out of compassion for those near and dear to that person pray that they stay, but ultimately we know that's up to Krishna. You know that story? Uh, you probably heard that story when the Prabhupada was on a train and and some men wanted to see him and they came in his 
compartment and they asked for blessings, which naturally we asked for blessings from sadhus. But Prabhupada knew that they were asking for material blessings, so he asked them, what blessings do you want? And they said, you know, health and wealth and, and happiness like that. Natural material blessings people ask from sadhus that they really shouldn't ask. And Prabhupada said, you see these brahmacharis, shaved head, dhoti, like that. He said, I can give you those blessings. Those are the blessings I give. You know, and they are, then they were, thank you, Swamiji, Hare Krishna. You know, that was, you know, that was not what they came for, right? So, <laughs> um, so we, you know, we want to be clear on what is a blessing and what is not a blessing, right? And, and, you know, like when my father was dying, I didn't pray that he'd live because he was just suffering. Why would I want him to suffer more? Thank you for that question. That was an important question. Hare Krishna. So, please, do we have any more? Uh, no more questions, Prabhuji. And we have taken more the time also. She told me half an hour more. So we are almost there. So we are very, very grateful to you. It was a okay, very one more uh, important question. and timely message for the all best of us. Question, the best questions about to come. One more question. Okay, one more questions we can ask. Devotees? If you want, you don't have to. Other, I, yeah. I can ask yes. you a question. Uh, I can, I can, yeah. There are a couple of questions, but they are repeat, uh, Prabhuji, of what we have already answered. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Vidhi, Vidhi has a question, right? You have a question? Vidhi has her hand up. Yes. You, have to, you can unmute yourself, you want to ask? Hare Krishna, Vidhi Mataji, do you have a question? Okay, unmute. Uh, Ronnie Prabhu, can you unmute her? Okay, okay. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Mahaj. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Dandra Pranam to all the devotees. Uh, Prabhuji, I just want to ask how to bring our parents into Krishna consciousness. It's very difficult, I feel, uh, because when I was young, I, I, I've seen my father reading Gita. Uh, but now I feel that uh, every time I visit my parents' house and I, I have to tell them, that I've given you Gita, why don't you start reading? But they uh, every time he's having an excuse, he says, I'm not keeping well, I have a lot of work to do, and something or the yeah. other. How to yeah. bring them into consciousness again? Yeah. Uh, I think first, every situation has its own unique elements, so I don't know if there's one exact answer. But I will start first by saying, generally, the best way to help anyone become Krishna conscious is for you to be Krishna conscious. Now, Nidhi, Vidhi, imagine you were like on Prabhupada's level. So all you'd have to do is kind of like show up at home and your father would just start chanting Japa, right? Give me those beads, I'll just see you. Like, you know, you were so effulgent. Prema is emanating from your heart. I just want to be like you and chant. So, of course, that's not such a practical answer because overnight we can't get Prema, but that's the ultimate answer, right? That, um, I think maybe you're going to have to trick him, saying, you know, go over there and say, can you read the Gita to me? I, I love it when I hear you read the Gita because I grew up watching you read the Gita and it has like a really, it was just, it reminds me of when I was a young girl and it would really, you know, could you do that for me? And he'll, the loving father would say, okay. And then he reads the Gita and then he remembers the things that he was reading. Because if you try to reason with him philosophically, you know, it may not work and you're his daughter, so, you know. You know, parents generally don't want to always follow the advice of their kids. They want to give advice to their kids. But, you know, yes, Daddy, it's true, you're busy, but you'll always be busy and, you know, you'll never have time. He might acknowledge that, but, you know, it's, you know, if it 
comes from a sadhu maybe, but from his daughter, I'm not sure. So, um, can you take me, can you, can we do this puja at the temple? I'd like to do it with you. you know, well, now's not the time, but you know, you like, in, I used to tell my daughter when she was like five, will you chant Japa with me? Because I get inspired when I chant with you, you know. So you could maybe make your father feel he's an inspiration by doing these spiritual practices and you'd like doing it with him. I don't know if that would work. It's a thought, but it, it, it may, re, you know, it's like Prabhupada said, I tricked you with prasadam. You know, that it's so sometimes, you know, it's quote unquote, we have to trick people into being Krishna conscious. Prabhuji, I want to add one thing. I am uh, living in um, uh, this Delhi, Delhi here in Saibabad, but my uh, my father is in Amritsar. He's in Punjab. Oh, okay. So I you cannot can visit, I cannot be in uh, contact with him just only through, uh, by just telling him on phone. I, yeah. I can just, uh, so I know okay. the time is uh, going by and I want him to be into the consciousness. Now, how can I help him? Yeah, so let's take, let's take that idea and say, I would really like it because we're not together if like every Sunday for 15 minutes we could just chant Gita Shlokas together. That would really, I would just, you know, even if you don't want to do it, it would really please me. And would you do that? And if he agrees to do that, then he's going to remember everything he read when he was younger, right? And it's going to start working on him. Or if we could just chant one round together, that would really just be an inspiration for me. Because um, you've always inspired me in this. Something like that. Would he do that? Yes, Prabhuji. Uh, well, yeah, I can. I'll try to definitely. Uh, Prabhuji, I belong to a very uh, spiritual family, a family of devotees, wherein my uh, grandparents, they were into Krishna consciousness only. Yeah, yeah. And uh, But my father was initially was there, but I don't know why, what, hap what has happened now. Why my father is not into it anymore. So uh, is yeah. it Prarabdh only? Is it Prarabdh? Well, I know, I learned something from Giri Rashwami when, when um, or other devotees, uh, maybe you're aware of this, when they're not doing something religious, they're, they're, when they're doing something irreligious, you throw this question out, what would your father think? And they just turn red, because they know, they're, you know their father, you know the picture, the father and the dhoti, and then the the next one in a suit and the next one with, you know, earrings in his nose and, you know, it's like it's just coming down and tattoos all over his face. So the disciplic succession of Kali Yuga. So, you know, when you say, what would your father think of what you're doing? They know the answer that he wouldn't like it. And, and, and in your culture, you have such a deep respect built in for parents and doing what your parents want that that's something i don't know if it still works but that's something you know you maybe not have to question in that way it's just say i think your father would really appreciate it if you if we're like we were reading the gita together i think he'd really feel that you know this is what you should do as a father so you know what speak of you what would your grandfather think if your father wasn't that religious then go to your grandfather at some point somebody was religious you know what would your great 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 grandfather think of what you're doing and um you know, because what you're trying to do is kind of connect them to make sense on their own rather than you tell them by reflection, you know, like, so, but, but the point is anything we could do for anybody to get them to do something Krishna conscious, somehow or other, it's going to help them, you know, could you just chat with me? It really helps me when I chat with you. And, and then they chat. Let me tell you a story that will end with a story. This is a beautiful story. It's a story of two different devotees with two different, two different devotees, two situations in life which were almost identical. They became devotees. Well, one was born a devotee, and they both left Krishna consciousness for like 10 years, and they left it in grand style, like, I'm never going to chant again. I want nothing to do with Krishna like that. And they both became very successful, one extremely successful, many businesses, and they both ended up divorced and miserable and depressed. And when they hit rock bottom, all of a sudden, 
they started chanting Japa. And both of them said, I don't even know why. Because I had stopped, I had turned my back on Krishna, and I just sat, I just sat down chanting, and I couldn't stop for like an hour just chanting. And at that point, they said, that was the point where everything came back to me. Everything changed. You know, one hour of Japa after 10 years. So, you know, if you get your father to hear and chant with you, don't underestimate the power that that has in reviving him, bringing him to Krishna consciousness. So any way you can do it, you know, the affection of the daughter, oh, daddy, you know, please, you know, I'd love to do this with you. You know, we don't get to see one another. Let's do this. That would mean so much to me, right? Or at least let's do it today. It's Mother's Day. Do it for me. For, on Mother's Day, on my Mother's Day gift. He said, what do you want? This is what I want, that we do this every Sunday. So who knows? And then you can watch him become Krishna conscious because especially for Indians, they don't need a lot to bring out their Krishna consciousness. We as Americans, we need tons. We have to do 100 times more than you do to get one hundredth of the result. You hardly have to do anything, and then it's like it all comes out. It's like Prabhupada said, it's in the heart. You just have to like scratch a little, you know, and then you get to it. And we Americans, we're, we, we scratch like all day and night, and we hardly find anything. So um, that's the um, benefit that you have. So you can scratch a little. If you can scratch his heart a little, I think you'll get a good result. Okay, I guess if we don't stop now, we will never end, So, which is not a bad idea, but you probably have other things to do. Right? <laughs> no, what better could be, Prabhuji, to, to keep on hearing and get this association? And Vidhi Mataji is also saying thank you so much, and we have so many messages thanking you for this timely association. So uh, we thank you so very much, Prabhuji. And uh, we had given earlier a topic on initiation and Guru Tattva. So maybe, you know, once things stabilize, then maybe we can request yeah. again, Prabhuji, please give us your association. At least this yeah. is the benefit of this online association that we can get association across the continents. So thank you so, so very much. And uh, everyone, I can ask everybody request, please unmute yourself and we can loudly chant and thank Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Hare Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Krishna Thank you Prabhu ji Thank you very much Thank you Prabhu ji Hare Krishna Last thing I want to say is that the Khan worldwide community has vested interest in India recovering because we all want to go back to India. I would spend you know, months and months every year in Mayapur. I have a, we have an apartment there and we haven't been there in a year and a half. So we are all also praying, to, <laughs> even though maybe a little selfishly, we're also praying that things recuperate so we can again be there. And then it'd be nice to see you all someday, visit your temple. And, Yes, Prabhuji. So we now have a new temple. Last time you came, it was a base.